Hello, Nikki. <laughs> Good to have you here, Nikki. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to do a usual thing and just wait a few minutes for people to join. So I'm actually a little over, well, it might appear that I'm overdressed, but it is freezing. It is freezing. Hey, Kathy. Kathy, it's so cold here. Oh, my word, it's unbelievable. Hey, Kim. Lovely to see lots of familiar names there. I hope, you, I hope everyone's well. I hope you're all well. Crazy, crazy world at the moment. You know, it's just outrageous out there. Um, let me just make sure I'm all ready. Make my office ready. Hello, Doris. Good to have you here. Hey, Jill. <laughs> Jill. Oh, welcome, everyone. Welcome. Marie 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 Sorry if I'm saying your name's wrong. Hey Marie, welcome from Miami. Oh my word, I'd give up. I'd give this up for Miami Heat any day, any day. Drew, Drew, welcome. Doris, Anna, welcome, 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 welcome. Shannon, Terje, welcome everyone. Sanjvi, bring it in. Bring it in. We're going to give it a few minutes as per usual. As per usual. Yeah, cold front came out of nowhere. And we went from kind of normal chilly weather to apocalyptically, apocalyptically, oh, I can't even say it. Just really cold. It's really cold weather. It's freezing. I think it's one degree in Cape Town. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Kim. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Mar Did I say Marty? Is it Mar Mar Marty? Marty? Am I saying that right? Sorry if I get names wrong. I'm so excited to talk about Ethiopia. I hope everyone else is too. I think, I think we can start. What's the time? Two minutes? Give it a few more minutes. Why not? Hmm. Okay, almost ready. Almost ready. I'm not going to take too much of your time. You know, I can only, I can only say so much about Ethiopia. Um, you know, those of you who, who know me already know that I've been raving about it a rather large amount. Um, and for good reason. It is, honestly, I've just... Hi, Elisa. Welcome, Elisa. Good to have you here. I think we can almost start. It is truly... It's, it's just... Words, words, I've been writing, I mean, I love writing sometimes. Those of you who write as well, you'll know that you can write sometimes, some days you can just flows out of you and some days it doesn't. But even on the days where it's easy, it's just, I just cannot find the right words to describe Ethiopia in general. I mean, it really is a completely unique place, unique to Africa, unique to the world. It's, there's nowhere else like it that I've ever seen. The people, the animals, the whole experience is just, it's, it's been in my thoughts the second I left. Not a day has gone by. And I've seen a lot, I've been very grateful, very grateful um, and very lucky to see a lot of Africa. And in fact, some places outside of Africa. But uh, nothing was like that, I'll tell you what. Nothing was like that. Three minutes, let's get going. Let's get going because I'm sure people from all over the world, we've got Netherlands, we've got various places in the States, all kinds of places. All kinds of places. DC. <laughs> okay. So, what I'm going to do, take you a little, a little virtual tour. So, this, there's so much to talk about with Ethiopia, really. I mean, there's places in there that I haven't even been to that, that are just like are haunting my dreams. Like, I just have, I have to see them. It's come like, the, um, you know, there's places in the Danical Depression which I'm dying to get to. It's an incredible place. But we're not going to talk about Ethiopia as a whole. We just don't have time. We, we, we would have to go for a for a for a whole course on Ethiopia. There's so many things to talk about. What we're going to talk about specifically is is what you could call the three main attractions of Ethiopia, the the, the flagship experiences of Ethiopia, um, which which kind of draw the most amount of people. And for 
the, the you know for good reason um and even when i was there i mean i was there in, in the best uh time of year to go and it really was never felt crowded there were there's just it's it's not it's surprising me it's not visited enough which i think is a, is a, is a is part of the beauty in this whole experience is like you never feel that there's so many people in the in the simian mountains for example <laughs> You had troops of hundreds of gelato baboons to yourself. I think once we had another group of visitors to Simeon Mountains who were with us. Um, otherwise, there's no one there. There's no one there. It's really amazing how, you know, one of the most exciting places I've ever seen in my entire life is, uh, is not crowded. Um, and I think it's amazing because we can have all these places almost to ourselves. You know, obviously in places like Libe La Libela and Oma Valley, there's a lot of people, but the people are part of that whole experience, the tribes. Um, La Libella, you know, there's pilgrims, there's, there's priests there all the time. So the residents are, are all there and it's, and it's really wonderful. They're really nice to you. So let's get started. So we're going to talk about three main things. We're going to talk about La Libella. La Libella, for those of you who don't know, is, is the church, uh, one of the holy cities of, of Ethiopia alongside Exum to its north. It's, it's regarded as, as, some say Exum is the holiest city, some say La Libella is the holiest city, but it's up there with the two holiest cities of um of Ethiopia and its history on its own. Take all your cameras down, put them on the ground and just listen to the guide. We have a really good guide, Sisa, that I've actually got a picture of old Sisa here. Um, he joins us for the whole trip. He is one of the most, and I've always been a, like, a, a, you can, not obsessed, but like really, I think, oh, you can barely see him. What a legend, there he is. Sisa is gonna join us. Guides in a place like this make, make the experience and Sisa's knowledge, I mean, it's incredible and he's going to join us for the whole trip he, he really was an inspiration i've seen in my whole lifetime of guiding in africa i've seen a, a few people like him who who know the place so intimately and are so passionate about it. he picks us up in in dar es salaam we meet him there and it's just from there he's hilarious and he's just brilliant um going to lalibela and and when you hear the history of lalibela it really is incredible this is the the rock churches 11 rock churches that were were built to 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 replicate Jerusalem. Jerusalem was was invaded by Saladin and captured. So they built Lalibela to replicate Jerusalem, but they built it into the ground for a couple of theories. And one of them was that it couldn't be seen by invading Muslim armies who wanted to, wanted to capture it. And in fact, there's there's records that um, a Muslim army claimed to have burnt one found the churches and burnt them. And they did find a church, but it wasn't one of the 11 rock churches of Ladibella. So digging it into the ground might've helped. When you're standing next to me, some of these churches are really big. I actually find a, um, I've uploaded pictures. So this is the, one of the more uh, famous ones, Church of St. George. You can see it's huge, but if you're standing a hundred meters away, you can't see it because you're kind of at ground level unless you're down below, but then there's trees. So they are really hidden. And apart from St. George, they're mostly interlinked through tunnels so you just part you, you mind your way through these tunnels and you can literally see the chips on the wall of how people dug down they reckon um 23,000 people no 44,000 people over the space of 23 years built um these 11 churches which is, is fascinating you can literally see every single chip in the rock of people just chipping away chipping away chipping away chipping away and going all the way down and then they chip through these windows bang and then um, hollowed out the inside. So uh, Elisa, good question. Um, so she's asking about a photo permit. So that's all covered in the cost. You do actually need a permit, but um, we pay for that on arrival and it's, it's not a large amount of money at all. The one thing you can't do is film inside the churches. I'm not sure why, but um, you're not allowed filming inside the churches. Um, but yeah, the, the photo permit's very cheap in it. And it goes quite nicely. I mean, I like to think everyone in, 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 uh, with kind of their, their fingers in that pie are good and holy and, and righteous people. Um, and all the money goes back into restoring the churches. Actually, you'll see some of the churches, I don't know if I have a photograph of it here, have steel roofs that have been put over them in, in recent years because they were falling apart. The rain was corroding them. So it goes back into maintaining them and keeping them um, uh, alive and and well looked after so um small amount of money and it's really great and you got once you've done that you've got freedom to just go whenever you like it's obviously you know we we play it by ear it's really special because you can get these those of you are interested in 
in people and, and architecture and especially ones which have significant historical, um, a, a significant historical past. Lali Bella is going is, is to be like a kid in a candy shop. Just the history of it is just incredible. And um, when the light comes down, it sneaks through these gaps next to, like you see next to St. George. Priests are down there all the time. So they will try and kind of find places where they can be in the light. And you, the compositions, you learn so much about composition and how to break the rules and form your own patterns. And it is just magic. And you kind of stay out of everyone's way, which is really cool. And the priests just come by and walk walk past you and they don't really take much note of you um pilgrims as well they just just cruise straight past you which is really cool that it's almost like you're not there you find a little corner and then you find your compositions and you sit there and you know this is this is the photographic aspect which you know we must comment on because it is the strangest place to photograph but you can get the most unique photographs i mean photographs that that you know no one else can get in the world even to this day there's nothing like lali bella on the planet the way that people dress, the way they act, the way that the situation at the end down below the surface, the way these churches are, are constructed. Um, even, I mean, there's a, I forget his name. He was, a, I think he was Portuguese. He was the second. Um, thanks, Sanjvi. Thank you very much. So Sanjvi has a great, great question about Lali Bella, how relaxed people are about being photographed. And it's obviously something we all have to be very sensitive to. Some people are not sensitive to it. And, you know, it's not something obviously we'll, we'll tolerate. Um, and we're not going to, I mean, I know no one on this webinar is ever going to do something like some of the things I saw people do, but you've got to be sensitive and the priests don't mind. The priests and the pilgrims know that the money generated from us coming to see their churches and photograph them and the churches gets put back into keeping the churches alive, which is a big task, um, to maintaining them. So, um, you do have to be careful and quite often you'll be walking along and you don't really, if you are far back and if you're shooting really wide, like those of you follow me online, you'll see a lot of my images that I post are quite wide. It's people involved, but it's a big scene down a tunnel in a corner, trying to catch those lights, big compositions, big pictures. Um, those are, those are kind of what you're aiming for. But if you want to do portraits, you simply ask, and they're so used to getting asked. They just go, you know, can we take your picture? Would you like a picture? And, they, and, and sometimes they come there when you walk past and say, Hey, if you want, you can take my picture. It's up to you. So it's very chill. It's very relaxed. Um, and there's no, there's no kind of hostil hostilities about taking images, but, you do obviously have to do it in a respectful manner, which is which is which I'm sure all of you are, are absolutely well versed with. So um, I hope that answers your question, Sandsby. Um, they really don't mind; it's part of the whole thing, which is which is really great. Um, but yeah, it is. I mean, it's an amazing experience. I've got some more pictures here. This is the type of stuff I'm talking about. So you can go into, you know, little tunnels. Sorry, I didn't sharpen for screen on my export, so a lot of my photos are a little bit blurry, but it's fine. Um, and you can go from shooting these tunnels, and the priests kind of walk along. They come out. This is one of one of the. She's actually a pilgrim. Some of them have worked for walk for two weeks, and they kind of don't, don't notice you. So you sit back, and I'm further back than it looks in the photo, and you just watch the tunnel, and you can compose everything. And when they come through, they smile at you. You take a picture, um, and you can get really nice, interesting compositions. And while you can go along, there's there's, there's new priests being trained, um, and the whole time. I mean, this is a very very interactive experience, not just about the photographs. We're learning a hell of a lot about photography, but right alongside it, a lot of the history of Ethiopia. I mean, it, it would be a crime not to, to take in um, the, the, the interpretation that's happening all the time. The guide, Seaside's brilliant. We use a guide here called Mass. He's brilliant. He knows the place like the back of his hand. And you just, it's enthralling to, to hear what he has to say about Lali Bella. I don't want to give up too much of, of the history of Lali Bella because it's better when you hear it in person when you're standing inside those rock walls. It is fascinating. That's actually our first stop. Lali Bella, we go straight from Addis Ababa. Just on, on a quick note, it's kind of, it's kind of the experience is, is dwarfed by the stuff that we, we're going to talk about now, but Addis Ababa itself is fascinating. Um, Lucy's there, cradle of mankind, there's museums we can visit, there's markets, biggest open air market on the planet um, where we can visit. Um, if you don't, not into crowds, that's probably not a good idea, but if you, if you want to see how, you know, the, the Ethiopians live in, and, and interact in the city, there's so many things we can do on that first afternoon that we're there. So that one we play by ear and it's completely configurable and um, we'll play that one by ear. But now we've gone into Lali Bella. I've showed you Lali Bella. Lali Bella is amazing. I've got no videos on Lali Bella. Like I said, no videos allowed. Um, here's another priest. I'm sure many of you have probably seen these photographs of, um, this is inside one of the churches uh, and you know, the, the, the only light coming into the church. Some of them have got a bit of electricity coming in now. 
but mostly the only light is by candles and these windows, which means if you're lucky enough, I mean, we were very lucky this priest started, started uh, getting some light in the book he was, he was reading. So we managed to get a few things like this. This is unedited, obviously. If you take a picture like this, get rid of some of those dust spots. That's a little bit aggressive. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much, here's another priest. There we go. Sometimes, you know, like this, this gentleman, he stands there and, um, you know, kind of to be, to be frank, he's posing. So, I mean, he's the Lully Bella. He's the face of Lully Bella. So you'll see this exact gentleman with that exact cross all over the world. Um, so there's going to be a few of them that actually, you know, they'll stand there and they'll pose and say, take a picture and, and you know, you, you give a little bit of money and that money goes to the, the, the rest of the priests and the up, uptake of the, of the church. But the really fun part is finding your own little corner and doing your own little compositions, getting really artistic and creative. I mean, it's a nice way to start with this because by starting with this, we get to really deconstruct composition and how to place your subject and, and, and how to tell a story through composition and, and, you know, how to give things visual mass and take from, take away visual mass from things you don't really want in the, in the frame. So really, really cool to, to start this trip on an interpretive experience and on a photographic experience. We've had Lalibela. We're going to, I don't like saying my favorite, but I'm going to say it now because it just blew my mind off. This place, the Simeon Mountains. Guys, Ethiopia, if you just go to see this place, I'm just trying to get out of the way. Get out of the way completely. Full screen. Oh, sorry, Elisa. I actually should have mentioned that. Uh, so it's, it's one full day in, in Lalibela. It's two nights. So we have one full day and two nights. And we get there quite early. So the first afternoon, we actually see churches. And then we see the churches the whole of the next day. We can get out early on the last morning, but there's not really a point. We would have really um, gathered quite a lot of uh, what we want from the churches. You can see them all in kind of one go. Um, they're all very close to each other. You actually walk from, from one to the other. Uh, so it's two nights, one full day in Lalibela, and um, one afternoon and the morning if you want. And then we fly from... Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. We fly from Lalibela to Gondar. Now, Gondar has incredible history we're not going to in our first sight of gondar we're not going to we're literally just going to have a lay, uh, straight onto another flight and go onto um sorry not onto another flight onto a jeep we drive from gondar into the simian mountains a beautiful drive and um simian mountains we spend uh, quite a bit more time it's four nights here so four nights in the simian mountains three full days so we want three full days because we can choose between uh, literally just staring at these mountains all day, which you can do. <laughs> and the landscape is just, these mountains, I've never seen it before, they fall in a single fall to the lowlands. It doesn't like kind of cascade like other mountain ranges I've seen. It just falls, these cliffs just fall, oof, and then it just keeps going down, 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 down into the lowlands and eventually just disappears. It's, it's, it's mind-blowingly beautiful. Um, but obviously, you know, we, we want to do more than just watch the mountains. Um, so another really diverse dynamic place in terms of photography and in terms of the experience itself because we can do landscape photography astrophotography i got up really early in the morning last time i was there and we were doing the stars um at night and combining it with the mountains trying to do day night combinations just mixing it up it's brilliant um i really love this photo because it gives scale to your everyday experience in, in ethiopia you drive along this ridge because the, the gelada baboons i'm sure you you all know by now what the gelada baboons are i'll show you pictures now if you don't um they, they, they sleep on the cliffs uh, historically. There's still some leopard and, and hyena there. I know of a guy who, who did a documentary there. He was there for five years. He saw, I think he saw a leopard once. So they are there, but very skittish. They don't want to be seen by people. Hyenas do patrol the, the, the ridges, um, so the baboons sleep there at night. And you just drive first thing in the morning along there, and you want to catch these geladas as soon as they come over the crest, and then they play on the ridge. And that's, that's the shot you want, is you want the gelada. I mean, if, if there was a gelada sitting where this grass is now, that's, that's the shot you want. Simeon Mountains, Gelada Mountains breaking away and falling away behind them. I mean, that is just incredible to look at, let alone photograph. But um, for those of you in case, let me just look at the, I've always wondered why. Hmm. Sorry, Kim. Um, I I'm not sure why I was Zoom, but there's a webinar chat and then there's a Q&A and I keep forgetting to to put up the Q&A. Uh, 
what type of lens for the portraits. So because this is such, it's a very good question actually that, that Kim has. We'll get back onto the geladas now. We've got time. It's such a dynamic safari. In fact, it's, it's the most kind of evolving safari that I've, I've ever been on for sure in terms, in terms of photography of, of how many different genres you step into on, on one safari. Portraiture, landscapes, astrophotography, wildlife, you name it. We do all of it extensively. Like we often, you know, even in the Mara, sometimes we'll do a bit of stars from the camp. Um, so you always kind of dabble in stuff. But yeah, we, we really dig into each genre a lot. So you, you, you focus on, on, on genres quite a lot. So you've got to be careful with your lens choice because you're going to be carrying a lot of it. Personally, I would go with a, it's tempting to take a portrait lens, you know, a, a, a fixed 85 mil or 105 mil, um, which, which is portrait specific, but you're going to be carrying quite a lot of weight. So I would go with kind of a, a 2470, which can do portraiture, portraiture, a 7200. And, you know, if you have a couple of bodies, that'll, that'll literally do, that'll do Omo Valley, that'll do great portraits in the low light situations of the, of the, the churches, um, they're, they're definitely wide enough. So if you've got space, ideally, because we're doing a lot of portraiture, we're doing it in the Omo Valley, we're doing it in Lalibela, I'll take a portrait lens, an 85 mil, 105 mil, whatever portrait prime you have, it does make a difference in the quality. It's really beautiful. But if not, you're 100% okay with a 2470 and a 7200. What you have to do is make sure you have space for a big, um, telephoto lens because there is this is where the catch is the geladas you can sit amongst them let's see let me bring up a gelada okay so I hope I've answered that question Kim for the portrait side of things but in terms now they're in the subject of lenses if we're going to photograph geladas they're really easy you sit you sit amongst them you know they're not scared of you, you walk right up to them um, and there's hundreds of them all around you so a 7200 is perfect for this perfect but you've got to have your your wide angle on um, for, for shots like this, where you want to capture the gelada baboon and the falling away mountains. You want a really big picture. You don't want just the portrait of the baboon, which you can obviously do as well. And if it was just for the geladas, I would say bring a 2470 and a 7200 and then you can cover the whole trip. The only thing is, the reason why we do three days in the Simeon Mountains, three full days in the Simeon Mountains, four nights, is we might go see Walia Ibex. Now, they're not so scared of people. You can actually walk about... 100 we're about 100 yards from him and they're very chilled uh but 100 yards is a little bit too far for 7200 so while we're on lenses you gotta remember you gotta go wide so we've got to have i took a 20 mil fixed the sigma art lens a 20 mil and it's, i love it for landscapes and for for astrophotography and, and all kind of wide shots even with with geladas is what i took this image with was the with a 20 mil um uh, and I think even this image was also the 20 mil when I wanted to capture a lot of scene as well. 20, it's quite inconvenient. My 2470 is broken completely. So 2470 is really good for this because when you're with the geladas, you can just go in portraits really close. You can step back and get the wide shots. So 2470, 7200, if you've got another body hanging off you, especially if the genala males start fighting, which they do all the time, that you're not going to be, well, I mean, literally sometimes they run over, like right past you because they're not scared of you yet stones flying all over the place and you don't even know what to capture it's just baboons going mad yes kathy f4 24 70 and 7200 is good you'll be very good with that there's a good there's a good um good lens combination if you can pack that 24 70 and 7200 let's say you sneak in a portrait lens there 85 or 100 mil if you can pack a bigger lens inside then remember we rent gear as well i can also bring stuff up for you if you join us but if you if you you really want to take just in case we go see Walia Ibex, it's the only place in the world they found, um, and there's only 500 500 of them left. Um, but they are their numbers are climbing, which is which is great news. Uh, Ethiopian government, the new um, uh, president of Ethiopia, is an inspiration, and he's really turned the country around from from not a very good uh, story at all. So and they've put a, a 25 year imprisonment on if you if you kill one of these animals so they're, they're it's very serious and the government's looking after them well and we will definitely go and give it a little bash because going up to them you actually crest the highest peak in the Simeon mountains 
and it's from up there it's just magical so we will spend some time up there and you can find gelatos up there so it's a whole day excursion if you go looking for ibex so here i'll have whatever you have probably i'll keep it light if you have space for your 400 prime bring your 400 prime i took it this is a with a 500 prime 500 was 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 quite tight on space but remember i can also help you bring stuff up if you if you want uh, someone to bring a primaries but you want to have something in and around 400 mils for the ibex so bear that in mind 24 70 70 200 and 400 mils for the ibex right any other questions on lenses let me know otherwise we can talk more about these incredible animals gelatas mm. no man where are all my videos Yeah, I'll play this one for the time being. These are young ones. Part of the, the fun of, of watching gelato baboons because there's literally hundreds of them around you. Um, once you've found them, you can spend any amount of time you want with them, which is the best part. There's no rush. There's no people there. And some moments you can literally just watch the youngsters playing and they're nonstop. They're just going nuts the whole day. Sometimes right at your feet. Um, and you can, you can just play around and get however thousands of many images of this kind of thing going on around you. But what you want to focus on is the big males. This is why they call it, they actually call it a simian lion. Um, here's a picture of, I'm in the way of a big fella. Um, sorry, I know some of you have already seen the content, this content from Ethiopia. I'll play it again and explain it. This is the stuff you're looking for the whole time, which is really great. Um, Cesar will be with us again and he, and he loves, you know, I'll be, walking around with some of you and you can spread out this thing that nice thing. We all don't have to be together. I'll move around between everyone and you can go and find your own family group in this, this greater group of, of hundreds. Um, there's smaller family groups, five, five or six individuals, females and one dominant male. And then there's nomadic males who try and find their own family. And I think it evolves day by day. One day you've got a family, the next day you don't. So it's quite a stressful life for these big males, but it's really good for us in an experience point of view, there's always eruptions of fights between them. So you watch them and you can see this, this gelato in the back there is watching. And they're really big. I mean, these are big animals. Those of you that know chakma baboons, they're, they're in, in weight, they're probably the same size as a chakma, but they've got this huge mane, which is, which is absolutely ridiculous, um, which makes them look even bigger. And you watch these males kind of checking each other out. And eventually there's some teeth action. They'll, they'll grimace, pull their lips back, teeth come out, and um, they have a huge fight. And you want to be ready to capture that. 4,600 meters at the top, Alyssa, um, at the top of uh, the Simeon Mountains, 4,600 and something, um, where, we, where it was right at the peak up there. So where our camp is, is about 3,800. Um, that's where our lodge is. Beautiful lodge, Simeon Mountain Lodge. Um, very, very nice. Listen, those of you who have stayed in really fancy safari camps, this is, this is not a really fancy safari camp. It's really beautiful, and it's positioned right in the right spot where a lot of these gelato families are found. So sometimes gelatos come right through the camp. So it's in a really ideal location. Thatched rondavels, thatched huts. Those of you who don't know what a rondavel is, heat is inside to keep you warm. It's really cold up there, especially in the mornings and evenings. I take a ski jacket with me and um, that's just enough to keep me warm, but I'm a, I'm a very sensitive Zam into to cold weather. So um, I hope that answers that question. Altitude sickness is a real thing up here. Seaside is a big problem with it. That's why we do Lalibela first. Lalibela is high. It's in the high 2000s. And we actually acclimatize for those two days. And then we go up into the Simeon Mountains. So you've got to be careful with that. And we acclimatize first in Lalibela. And then we go up into the Simeon Mountains. And by then we, we're all good. Um, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. No, altitude sickness is a horrendous thing. I've only had it once, but it's, it's not fun at all. Here's another gelato fighting. I know you guys have seen some of this before. Um, I had some videos. Let me show you another video of um, gelatas. Gelatas having a having a row. I don't know if since you upload it. I mean, Zoom's obviously was created in a rush, so they, there's quite a few things they didn't iron out when they made this program. Um, uh, that's not going to fit for some reason. Let's see if this fits. Yeah, I know it's been added, but I'm not seeing it. Um, oh, yeah, let's try. Look at the <laughs> gelato males. I mean, how ridiculous is that man? It is absolutely outrageous. Outrageous. And you keep your eye on them. 
it's fascinating fascinating exploding in and out of war and then just being really gentle with the young ones oh it's a photographic just heaven absolute heaven Marie, they can they literally have uh, i could show you a video here they i've had two of these baboons fight and the male jumped over my legs to get after the other male they've got no no worry about you at all they're not it's not like um uh for example you gotta worry about like gorillas get a little bit too affectionate they're too like us they're too curious so sometimes you've got to watch a gorilla because you know they they get a little bit too curious about you these they're actually a monkey they're not a baboon but they're incorrectly called a, a baboon and i'm in the habit of calling it a baboon um they 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 sometimes notice you and i had a bit of a, a situation with a big male because his baby it was playing with a bunch of other babies and they had a big row and got out of control and this youngster ran into my leg and bounced off my leg and then looked at me and was like oh no i've run into a human and screamed and ran for its mum and then the whole family obviously thought that i'd started a fight so the male walked literally a meter from me and kind of looked at me and then went back to his family so technically you don't want that that to happen but sometimes it does there's never been an incident with a gelato baboon actually hurting someone it's never happened probably will never will they don't see us as a threat they don't see us as as competition they're just we're just bystanders so it's really beautiful and there's you know those of you who have been to minor pools and you've sat with elephants those of you that have been to gorillas and you sat with gorillas you know the the joy of not being in a jeep with an animal i mean this you're sitting amongst them and because they they're strictly grass eating it doesn't smell like a chakma baboon troop which is quite horrendous because they're dropping dung everywhere it doesn't smell like anything these things are so clean and it's and it's really an amazing experience very intimate you can find your own little group and we can play around and guys it starts from before the sun rises to after the sun sets there's no time limits this is an amazing thing about Simeon mountains there's no let's come back for breakfast we pack it with us we go on a day-long adventure every day by the end of the day you've got so many pictures you've done so many different things we come back to such a beautiful bar bar they claim it's the highest bar in Africa. Apparently, there's a higher one in Lesotho. I'm actually not sure. But anyway, it's higher. Who cares? And we all have some, you know, hot chocolate, wine, and we have a little editing session. So the bar is really nice. It's got nice tables, and we all just play with our photographs and reminisce from the day and big fire going, which is really, really special. So that's Simeon Mountains, guys. Personally, you cannot go to Ethiopia and not see the Simeon Mountains. It'll be, a, it'll be an absolute crime because it is... The most magnificent place scenically i've ever seen so we go from there um we've done wildlife we've 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 pictured we've taken and we've experienced wildlife to the maximum in these mountains unique species um endemic species to ethiopia up close and personal all day long now we want to finish strong with portraiture now so we end off with the omo valley tribes I really want to emphasize something about the Omo Valley tribes. I actually wrote a, uh, a blog. I don't know if, if any of you are keeping up on the blogs on WADA, but I wrote about the experience in the Omo Valley. The Omo Valley is changing rapidly. These, um, Terga, Terge, the, the best place to find the Ethiopian wolf is in the Bali Mountains. It's a little bit, or the Bale Mountains, depending on who you ask. B-A-L-E. I know it says it's, it's pronounced in our world as, as Bale, but a lot of people actually pronounced it as Bali. Um, so Bali Mountains, best place to find Ethiopian wolf. Unfortunately, it's a little bit out of our way. It's a big dog's leg. That's why I didn't add it into the journey. Um, but it's the best place to find it. And it's apparently quite easy. You go there for two, three days. I actually haven't been to the Bali Mountains myself. But um, two, three days, you're almost guaranteed to find it. But we do offer, those of you who really want to, at the end of the safari, we can bolt on. So there's two spaces left on our 2021 departure. If all three of you decide we actually really want to see the Bali Mountains, we customize it and we add two, three days on Bali Mountains wolf searching. So it's endemic to those, that, that mountain range. So we can, we can definitely go there um, and add that on, which, which is very easy to do. Thanks for that question, TJ. Good, good, good answer. Only wolf in Africa and um, incredibly rare and special animal. So we're going to Oma Valley. And um, those of you who want to experience, um, and I'm sure you want to being on this, this webinar, uh, these interesting 
and far out cultures of the world and potentially photograph them and learn a bit about, uh, about portraiture and all the rest of it. Omer Valley are some of the most interestingly dressed people on the planet. And they are not dying out, but they are changing their ways. I mean, I'll go as far as saying is maybe even 10, 10 years time, they're not going to be doing the lip thing. Those of you know the Mercy Tribe, let me show you a picture of the Mercy Tribe. Um, have a very large lip, up to 15 centimeters in diameter. They cut it into the bottom lip of a, of a girl when she's about 15 years old. Um, and they stretch it over time to get um, rather large. Mercy Tribe, uh, Dinkanesh Tribe, they do, um, sorry, not Dinkanesh, Mercy and Termi. Mercy, Mercy and Termi. The Termi are far to go to. So we probably won't make it to the Termi Tribe. They're very similar to the Mercy. Um, but the Termi tribe are very difficult to get to. So we stick with the Mercy and they look, look very similar. Um, so those of you who want to see them, it is changing fast. Um, and uh, it's, not, it's not due to photography. The world knows about them. It's, you know, kind of philanthropic giving from NGOs, which is really good. I mean, if, if you, can't, you can't really blame them for changing, their, their average life expectancy was 30 years old up until a couple of years ago. So the change is good for them, even though these cultures are going to, vanish from the world um, eventually um, just because of encroachment of cities and and modernization it's happening so you've got to get in here and you've got to experience it before it does happen because it really is a fascinating experience it's eight tribes in total we don't go to all of them but we do go to the most kind of dramatically dressed ones um, which is the 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 um, Dasanek tribe which are incredible they've got flowers and body paint and really beautiful um, colors all, all over them. So I'm look for a picture of Dasanek. Where is it? Okay, this is the Bena tribe. We actually don't, we have the option to, to, to go to markets where, you know, the various tribes. This is what's fascinating about these tribes, which I couldn't understand when I first saw them. I really, this for me was the hardest thing to comprehend about these tribes was how, diff, how small the Omo Valley is. I'm gonna show you quickly on a, um, uh, let me share screen. I haven't shared a screen in a while. There we go. Share screen on Google Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is my screen coming up? Is all these things in the way, or can can you just see Google? Um, make this full screen. Let me just see what the chats are saying. Okay, Jojo, you can see. No, 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 don't go back. Sorry, my work station has developed into quite a mess here. Um, chat's all gone somewhere now. I hope you all can see, all right? Oma National Park is here. Let me just zoom out, you can see Ethiopia. So we, we stand, the first uh, two thirds of this trip we spend in the north, okay? Lalibela over here, okay? and Simeon Mountains National Park over here. We spend a lot of time. And then we fly. We fly Ethiopia to Jinka, which is down here. Fly into this little town called Jinka. Um, we actually spend a night at Eco Omo Lodge because the Mercy are quite easy to find from, from Eco Omo Lodge. And then we explore the Omo River region. The Karol tribe, we actually have to drive quite far, stay here along the river. One of these bends, I can't remember which one. Um, the Karol tribe over there. And it's a very small region. And this is what fascinates me. And I, th I don't think there's any other place on it like Earth. That's not a big place. The Omo Valley. Really, it isn't. It's, it's you know, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's big. But it's not big enough to fit eight drastically different tribes in it. Completely different. They even speak a different dialect. Now, something more about their dialect, let me end, which I found interesting. Just, uh, no, no, no. Uh, stop here. Let's go back into where we were here. There we go. What's even more interesting is the Ethiopians can't speak their language. So you've got this completely forgotten valley where Ethiopians can't speak their language yet. We have to pick up a uh, translator from the actual Omo Valley who knows how to speak the dialect of these tribes. And even each dialect of each tribe is different. So they all come to marketplaces and they all trade with each other. Some are good at Cattle, um, Hama tribe are good at keeping, um, you know, livestock. So they all trade in their in their strengths and weaknesses, and 
uh, sorry, in, in, in what they're better at growing or producing. So really fascinating. We can go to the markets now. The markets I found, I don't really enjoy it. I think there's, you know, most people are wearing their civvies. They're, they're, there's a lot of modernized people in there and they're not as keen on, on, um, on, on photographs and it's not as authentic. Um, this is where this picture was taken. This is the Bena tribe. With all respect to them, they're not uh, the, the most interesting. So we don't actually go to a Bena tribe village, but we do go to the Karo, the Dasanek, the Mercy, and the Hammer, which are the four most interesting, um, at least in my opinion, the most uh, beautifully dressed and interesting. This is the Karo tribe here. They're the ones who have this white paint all over them. Um, incredibly, I mean, you might, like everyone's holding an AK-47 in, in, in ETF in Omo Valley, which is sometimes it could be intimidating, but it's actually, you have to buy yourself into marriage with an AK-47 and a whole bunch of chickens or cows or goats. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's pretty much every man of age will eventually have himself a rifle, preferably an AK. That's very, they get them from South Sudan and trade them and they're incredibly safe. It's, it's an incredibly safe place. Although these, they, they look intimidating. These people look scary in all their war paint. They're the friendliest people. They're so nice. Um, and we spent a good amount of time with them. Here's the, uh, here's the Hammer tribe you can see here. Hammer tribe are known for, for mud and red ochre, and they, they cover their hair in it. So they always look red and they love bronze. They love bronze bracelets, necklaces, cowrie shells. Um, no, sorry, cowrie shells are Bena tribe, but they love their bronze and leather. So it's another thing. So obviously, we got to understand this, this takes a lot. And I want to assure everyone that I'll be doing pretty much all of this with obviously the translator. You have to bargain in each tribe to take photographs, not bargain, but they expect a little bit of, of something. So quite often they charge you per image, per click. So every day is different. And, and what we're going to do with, with um, Dinkanesh tours, who we're going to be traveling with is we're actually going to take sorghum, food, seed, coffee, into the villages and give them actually material things that can help them with their everyday life, as well as we're obviously going to give them a little bit of currency and that goes a long way in their village. It's not a lot. Um, you know, some, some, some tribes want to kind of ask for a dollar a click, which is, is quite steep and usually we can bring that down. But the nice thing is you're not looking to fire away. Portraiture is a completely different game. You've got to rethink the way you do it. You set up a scene for one shot. You come out of each, each tribe with, 15 strong images, you've done very well. Um, and that's what you're aiming for. You're not aiming to click. Although some tribes like the Karo tribe, these guys, you cut a deal with them and we give them um, 800 burr for, sorry, 8,000 burr, okay? Which is not a lot of money between all of us. Not a lot at all. And you give it to the head, head of the village and he says, you guys can go wild. And then you, you go on the little tour of their village and they talk to you and you can take pictures at, at will. Take as many as you want. So every day is different. You don't have to worry about that. I'll do the bargaining. I'll do the chatting. I'll do all of that stuff. And then you just come and then we just get, um, get in the mix with these sweet tribes. And, and again, it's an interpretive experience. They also want to teach you about the tribe and we have, all, we have a lot of time with them. So while we're taking images, you're also learning a lot about them. So it's a really, really informative experience here. Mercy men, which were known to be quite aggressive, but I found them incredibly friendly and interesting very keen on phot photographs everyone wants to be photographed um and a, and a lot of what i'll be doing is not only setting you setting you up for portraiture and and doing the photographer aspect you have a guide who's going to be telling you the interpretation and telling you um different aspects about their lives and cultures on the photographic side i'll be controlling who comes in and chatting and keeping the smiles on their faces make sure we have it's so important it's imperative you have a good relationship with every tribe you you, you visit because as soon as you have smiles on their faces and they know that you're here to support them and we can, we can all be happy. They want to do everything for you. And you know, it doesn't matter if you take more than, you know, the photographs you've, you've paid for. I was there and I was on a tight budget on images and I never once felt that I needed more. It's really about planning and, and, and getting the single shot right and getting something pretty. If we're very lucky, we can see a bull jumping ceremony from the Hummer tribe, the young boy has to, has to jump over bulls to become a man. Very controversial. The women get whipped. Um, they want to, they have to. The they women have to chase down men who are carrying sticks, whippy sticks. Once they catch one and rip a stick out of their hand, 
they give the stick back to the man and the man whips her across the back. And the more whips you get across your back, the more of a woman you are, the greater you are, the more revered you are by the tribe. Very bizarre um, ceremony, I must admit, to, to witness. But then again, you know, you, you've got to put yourself in the shoes of these people who haven't been known to the world up until quite recently. It was actually a, a National Geographic documentary done on the Termi tribe that kind of introduced them to the world. But this is it. This is what we do. This is what the Oma Valley is all about. It's about getting to know these tribes. It's about getting to know portraiture as a genre and photography, um, really deconstructing it. We've got a big area to explore and a lot of people to meet and a lot of different situations to set up. I'll be bringing blinds. Those of you who want to try and use a blind in photography and get you know black backgrounds, I used it for some of these here. Um, they, funny enough, they've actually, a lot of these tribes have used blinds before. I pulled it out for the first time I went there. I said, do you mind if I use it? And they said, no, not at all. And they set it up because <laughs> they've, obviously, they've obviously been used it before, which in a way I was, I was a little bit like, hmm, how many photographers have been here with a blind? But the nice thing is that they're okay with it. So before these tribes, these traditions disappear completely, you can, you can, they're very happy for you to use a blind or you can use natural light. It's entirely up to you. So we really can get a, a, a really good grip of, of portrait photography and have some of the most interesting subjects on the planet to practice it with. And get good images with. So, I mean, that's that's the that's the that's the safari we're talking about in a nutshell. Um, really, I don't think there's there's a there's a there's a more diverse portfolio option on a single trip than this when you go from literally architecture, combination of people, portraiture, wildlife, and landscapes, and astrophotography, all in one big bundle. It's like a big, fascinating adventure, but it's a wildlife. It's a photography workshop at the same time. So really special. I'm excited. I'm so excited about it. I can't even begin to explain how excited I am about it. Um, and uh, let me see if, sorry, this question's coming through, but I'm not seeing it. Oh, here they are. Oh, guys, there's so many questions coming through. I don't know why these haven't been, haven't been seen. Um, uh, let me go to the last ones. Okay. Sorry, Marie, what do they what do they use what do they use what for exactly, Marie? Nikki, to answer your question, you've got to avoid it's the opposite to Southern Africa. You've got to avoid oh, the rifles is, historically is to protect their livestock against animals and marauding tribes. The tribes used to have quite a lot of conflict between them, historically, quite a lot of fighting between them. And this was to protect themselves and their livestock and, their, and their, 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 their village against marauding tribes and do the occasional maraud themselves. Um, so uh, these days it's mostly just to protect their livestock against uh, wildlife. Oma Valley National Park is actually a national park and there is lions, there is cheetah, there is leopard. So um, they protect their livestock with those rifles. Nikki, August to end of February is your best time. August is also a little bit, it's still a little bit risky. Um, it is very, it, the, the biggest thing is you've got to avoid Ethiopia's rainy season, which is actually the opposite to Southern Africa, which is our dry season, which is our winter months, kind of March, April, May, June, July. If you're in the mountains when it rains, whew, it can be quite difficult. Omo Valley, this is the thing, this is the thing is Omo Valley is actually, it's such a weird place, Ethiopia. Where it's dry in the Simeon Mountains, it's actually rains quite a lot in the Omo Valley during this period. But the Omo Valley is fine. If it rains a little bit, you've got dramatic skies, you've got clouds, you've got, or you, if it's dry, you've got dust. You can manage those conditions quite, quite nicely. What you don't want to be doing is in the Simeon Mountains in their rainy season. So our trip runs in, in, in December. Unfortunately, we've had to postpone our, our February one due to lots of trips being moved from next year. But we are going to put a February 2022 date up soon and potentially a November one. So end of the year, beginning of the year, but you don't want to sneak too far past February, March, if that makes sense. Hope that answers your question, Nikki. Um, so Kathy, good question. Flash, I personally would bring one. You can't use it in um, Lalibela and you don't need it in Lalibela. It's, it, I think it'll, it'll have a major effect on, negative effect on your photographs. But for, for Omo Valley, I'll definitely bring a flash. I'm also going to bring diffusers for those of you who don't have, um, and we can just soften the light a little bit. And, and, it's, and it's a really nice thing about the Omo Valley is you get to, 
learn how flashes interact with your camera because it's a, it's a bit of a science like you don't just stick a flash on and take a picture we're also going to be shooting flashes off the body we're not going to be shooting flashes on the body no, no front light it doesn't doesn't look that nice so we're going to be learning how to how to sync flashes and how flashes operate and and and, and um yeah so that answers your question sorry i'm going off on a tangent there kathy definitely worth bringing flashes two if you can you don't really need two one is fine i'm also going to be bringing reflectors so quite a lot of the time one two of you will be taking pictures of time this is why i keep the group small only three of us because it's 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 solely because of the omer value because if you have too many people trying to get a picture of one person, it doesn't work. So three of us, some can take a picture of someone who's behind a blind, someone can walk off with someone and do something with them in the woodland or their hut. You can play around. Someone can use the flash setup and um, you get my drift. We can, we can play around, learn how to use a flash. Um, that's all the questions on there, unless I've missed one. Mm, I think I've got all of them. So that's in a nutshell. I mean, it's, it's everything. It's absolutely everything on a photographic sense and in an experience sense. It plays, it'll, it'll really it'll change your life. I mean, it's, there's, no, there's no adventure, no expedition like it. Um, any other questions, everyone? I hope you've enjoyed. I've enjoyed it. I can't stop raving about this place. I hope I see some of, some of you there soon. Bear in mind, those of you who are, are, are aware of um, our wild art trips at the moment, um, we are moving them around. So if our current safari, that's the only one that's set at the moment for Ethiopia is in December, 1st of December next year, 2021. If those dates don't work for you, you just got to get hold of me. I'm in the process now of planning new dates for the next trip. And if you've got dates that you like, you can chat to me and I'll make sure that those dates line up with yours. Any other questions on the experience itself? I've had a good time. I hope you have. Otherwise, I'm going to let you all be. Have a great night. Thanks for joining. It's been a real pleasure having you on this webinar. And, um, oh my word, this, I don't know why it keeps, thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry guys, I saw, oh my word, the, the messages don't, don't keep coming up. So Nikki, um, Nikki, lots of night photography for the tribes. It's difficult, it's not easy. The Hummer tribe, we can get to um, during the night. Um, the, some of the other tribes are a little bit far away, but we can do stuff for the Hummer tribe at night. Um, but the thing is the tribesmen go to bed quite early. In their world, they don't really stay up past the nightfall. They don't have anything to see with. So when it goes to nightfall, they all kind of retreat to their huts and they, they go to bed. But the Hummer tribe are quite willing and quite close to camp. So we can stay up until about nine o'clock. And, and like, like you said, it's very interesting to combine um, the tribe, tribes with themselves and Milky Way above the moon is really beautiful. Kathy, 2021 dates starts on the 1st of December, 2021 and ends on the 12th of December, 2021. Thank you, Nikki. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. I hope that answers your questions. Sorry, uh, I saw these questions. They, you know, they weren't loading for some reason. I think that's everyone's questions. I hope that answers yours, Kathy. Yep. Beautiful. Thanks for joining. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to end the meeting. If, if, if no one has any more questions, let me check the Q&A thing. Is there anything in there? No. That'll be all. Have a fantastic day, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. And I'll chat to you very soon. Cheers, cheers.